actually this this is going to be very close to what you've already seen online i'll tell you guys what will be different today uh things will be different today if you participate <laughs> so that so if you if you get involved with me in discussion that's what will make this talk different from everything you've seen online and that's my experience in every talk that I've ever given, and it's also my experience in every lecture that I have ever given, of course, they're not lectures anymore. I, I come to class to interact with my students, not to lecture to them. So although I will actually, strictly speaking, be lecturing you today, um, my hope is that you will get involved and argue with me. I mean, if things that I say you disagree with, you should take me up on it and we can have a talk. We can have a discussion about it. That's what will make this meeting between us useful, how you get involved in, in what I say, okay? So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Enrique, should I get started? Uh, just uh, to introduce uh, Professor Daniel Levy. So it's our pleasure to have him with us, even uh, by uh, video, even by bio, uh, video conference, but uh, uh, as you know, he is the co-author of the book uh, Product and Process Design Principles, what is a quite important book on chemical engineering uh, topics, especially process design. Uh, first edition appeared in 2000, um, sorry, the, the fourth edition appeared in 2017, but uh, it, that was quite enough uh, an e-book on the fourth edition on 2019. Uh, where we can have uh, several, let's say, 90 video video clips associated with quiz questions, um, and 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 this could be a good path to the the, the first flipped textbook on process design. So, Professor Daniel, uh, that is um, in chemical engineering at Technio uh, Israel, uh, has also uh, been very active uh, in this development of his courseware and promotes student awareness and competence on all aspects of process in systems engineering. And he has uh, received several awards and prizes, as you uh, have uh, read in, in, in the slides of presentation, so I'm not reading all the, the awards, uh, but is quite active on all the uh, engineering, uh, chemical engineering education uh, aspects and uh, it is quite uh, a pleasure to have him with us. I hope this session will be quite active as his uh, wish. Thank you so much for, for this time and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Enrique, for that very nice introduction and for finally inviting me to Lisbon. We've been talking about this since before the pandemic, remember? Exactly. <laughs> so, so here I am. So here I am virtually in Lisbon. I've heard so much about your wonderful city. I'm hoping that the next time it won't just be virtual, but that will, remains to be seen. See what happens after this talk first. Huh? All right. So I'm going to talk to you in the next hour or so about um, the current, the currently the way I teach. I've been teaching uh, by flipping the classroom. In my first course that I did was 2015, and the last course I did was just before the pandemic sorted. So basically, when the pandemic hit, all the courses that I teach were already online. So I didn't really suffer from the pandemic. In fact, I learned from the pandemic. Uh, I've embraced Zoom and I carry on using Zoom now for some things that I do in class, as I'll explain as we get into the talk. Okay, now my area of research is process systems engineering. I imagine many of you in the, in the audience are also involved in PSC. And the aim of PSC is to harness computation to improve the design, control and operation of processing systems. Now suppose a processing system leads to the product distribution I'm showing you now on the screen, where, um, where a grade of 70% indicates the minimum quality required for saleable product. Now, clearly, none of us in this hall now would be comfortable with a production in which fully a third of the production is waste. In the same way, if we were teaching a course where this shows the grade distribution of our students, we should be equally unhappy because fully one third of our 
students haven't made the grade that we associate with mastery and we'd like our students to master what we teach them. Now I have a question for you. Is the objective, is our objective as teachers to teach our students? What do you think? I will pause and see what people think. Do we, are we really here just to teach? Is that our job? It's to make them learn. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. In fact, the objective is for our students to learn. What we teach is of secondary importance. If the students don't acquire what we've taught them and they haven't learned anything, we are wasting our time. Now, a more difficult question for you. So how will we know if our students have learned? That's not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's more difficult to answer, yeah. Some ideas, how will we know? How, in, in real time, in the classroom, how will we know whether the students have learned something? What by will be the so questions that we yeah, ask? Yeah, by questions. By the to and fro, by the discussion yeah. that goes on in class. Now, of course, it would be nice to have more than one or two people involved in the discussion. Again, you have a class of, say, 100 students, and if one or two are discussing with you, that means those one or two, maybe they've picked up something, but the others, you know, you don't know, right? So now, the point is this, and if, we, if, you, if you accept this point, I can probably close my presentation and finish my talk. In order for us to give time for students to learn and for us to, to um, distinguish between those that have learned and those that haven't learned, we have to give time for this discussion in class. If all we're doing in the classroom is just lecturing, there will be no serious time for this discussion and we will lose the opportunity of really understanding whether what we're doing has an effect or not, okay? Now, this is where I want you guys to get active. Please, please point your uh, smartphone to the link www.menti.com. You will be asked for a code. You should enter the code 83875757. Ah, Menti. Menti. It is menti.com and you should enter the code 8387. 5757. Five, seven. And by the way, once you've done that, don't hang up because there'll be another question at the end on the same link. Now, when you get to that, you, you're asked to make four statements about what your expectations are from the meeting you're having with me today. To what extent do you agree with those four statements from strongly, strongly disagree to strongly agree? There are sliders. Just um, enter... First of all, can you see this? Are you, are you picking this up? Can you see it? Wait, wait, wait. Access to it? Yeah. So yeah. If, just, if you're hoping to learn a lot. You, you want to mostly listen. You want to contribute to class discussion. You plan to ask, well, oh, this is a good start. Yes. But right now, only one person's answered me. Now two. Now I can see there are something like 15 of you in the audience. I'm going to wait for at least 10 people and then we'll discuss the results together. Okay. This is a very, very unusual result. We'll discuss it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually very excited about this result. I ho hopefully there is going to be proof of this feedback during the day. <laughs> we are strange students. <laughs> <laughs> strange is good. Strange is good. Strange is good, yeah. <laughs> if, if every class was the same, we would get bored very, very quickly yeah. as teachers. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's 15 that's pretty good okay so yeah this is a, a distribution slightly unusual but what you usually see and i'm obviously using this question in every every situation i have with people whether they be students or colleagues or giving a talk like this you know internationally always it's the same the same question the highest uh, agreement is with, with, with the first statement. Everybody comes to a session like this hoping to learn something, so it's not unusual. But the other three are important too, because if mostly one wants to listen and not get involved, the chances of learning a lot is much lower, right? Obviously, the more you get involved yourself 
in the material that you're trying to uh, learn, the more you're going to learn. I'm very happy to see that the, the, the desire to contribute to class discussion is relatively high. Uh, planning to ask questions is a problem because that usually puts you on the edge and students very often won't want to, you know, put their heads on the block, right? But this is actually a very nice result. Okay, very nice. Okay, we are now after three semesters of lockdown teaching. And in this lockdown teaching, the pandemic forced all of us to teach 100% online. So we all experienced the need to transmit information 100% online. So you would have thought that this would lead to good results because we would acquire good habits. Unfortunately, when people were doing this 100% online, most of the people were using Zoom synchronously. That means they were just transmitting the same lectures. Instead of being in the classroom, they're just doing it live over Zoom, right? So again, lecturing. Worse still, I don't know if that's true in Portugal, definitely it's true in, in Israel where I teach in, in the Technion, the TAs were also doing the same thing. They were transmitting their exercises 100% online on Zoom. But again, they were giving basically another lecture. It wasn't interactive with the students. They were just demonstrating. Okay. So we had, we had the opportunity to use technology. You saw, for example, just simply using Mentimeter as a way of getting feedback from the students. Despite these technical possibilities, most teachers were doing everything in a way that the student was left passive. He was just there listening, okay? So for the most part, we weren't harnessing technology to make learning more effective. We weren't moving some of the lectures online to leave time in class for students to actually, to actually work with the materials. And they weren't using, we weren't using the contact time to enable active learning. Let me drive that home point, that, that point home. In a traditional classroom, it starts like this. You bring students totally tabula rasa. They know nothing. They come to <laughs> class and they acquire the information, initial information from the lecture. The lectures are delivered at the teacher's pace. That means not at the student's pace. That means most students will probably find the, the pace of the lecture too fast. The very good students will find it too slow you maybe match up with maybe 5% of your class. Everybody else, it's either too fast, mostly, or too slow. If there is any activity, it will be a very small percentage of the class will get involved with a question and answer session with the lecturer. And even then it's going to be, is that a full stop after the sentence or is it a comma? It's not gonna be very much about content because this is the first time the students have learned the material. They, <laughs> Especially if they're guys, they have no ability to multitask. If it was a classroom of women, maybe there'd be some hope because women can multitask, men can't. So either they're listening or they're, uh, or they're absorbing. It's one or the other. They're not also going to be able to ask questions. So therefore, the questions will be really trivial. They won't be really significant. And worst of all, as a teacher, you have absolutely no idea whether the class got it or not, right? And that's it. That was your contact with the students. And that's all you'll be doing until the next time around, one week later, where the same story will happen. No problem. There's an exercise session. Okay, now the students come to the exercise session and now the lecture, the, the lecture is now given by the assistant. He will stand solemnly in front of the class and show the students how he or she solves exercises. Again, with very little participation, some of the students won't have listened to the lecture by the lecturer, so it's even worse. The, the assistant in the technical sometimes is having to transmit the lecture material as well. So there is no exercise going on, definitely not from the point of view of the students. Now, when a, an assistant presents the way he solves a problem to a student, it's about as effective as you and I going to the gym, watching how our gym instructor lifts weight for us, okay? We're not going to gain much muscle mass this way, right? He will, for sure. He or she will. So we will be passive in the loop. We get very, very little out of this. And then if we continue the process, then the student goes home and does homework. This is the first time the student will be expected to do something himself. But now the student is on his own. He has no one to ask. He's really stuck. If you require students to hand in this work, they will all hand in work. It won't all be their work, but they will hand in work, okay? 
even if you give feedback to the students, which is very difficult to do, but even if you were to give feedback to the students, it would come too late. They will get feedback one week down the road, which is already in new material. He won't have got feedback in time that's helping him or her to learn the material. So basically in the traditional classroom, the way I've set this up, the student in all the contact hours with the staff is passive. So therefore his learning or her learning very, is very inefficient. It was Harry Lloyd Miller who pointed out that lecturing is that mysterious process by which the contents of the notebook of the professor are transferred through the instrument of the fountain pen to the notebook of the student without passing through the mind of either. And unfortunately, this is very amusing, but unfortunately there is an element of truth in this. This is a very, very inefficient way of transmitting any information to anyone, okay? And as we know, passive students for sure learn less. And that's not me saying it, everyone knows this is true, okay? We need to change this way of teaching. And when do we find out that the student hasn't learned? When we come to the final exam, when we get this result, 30% of the class, if we're lucky, didn't make the grade, okay? Either they didn't pass the exam or they passed with very, very poor grades indicating he doesn't, the person doesn't really have it, okay? And now it's unfortunately too late to fix the problem. This non-mastery now moves down the chain to the next course in the link. And so this is not working, guys. This is absolutely not working. We need to change what we're doing. Now, let me introduce you, probably not introduce you. I'm sure everyone in the room knows who Benjamin Bloom is. And he's very famous for what I'm showing here, his taxonomy. Taxonomy, which basically provides a framework for classification of various degrees of cognitive learning, cognitive acqu acquiring of, of information of the student from the very basic level of remembering and understanding all the way to the higher levels of analysis, analysis evaluation, and synthesis. Okay, now I am actually at the end of this chain. I'm teaching process design, process control. So I'm right at the top here because everything I ask my students ultimately is in that final category. But of course, I need to teach them things. So I need to do all, all of these steps. But in addition to this taxonomy, taxonomy, Bloom is famous for a whole bunch of other things. In 1968, for example, he very, very distinctly wrote down the four conditions uh, that are required for a student to achieve mastery. Well, the first thing we need to do as teachers is to, is to define what we mean by mastery. What is it the student has to be able to demonstrate to show us that he has mastered the material? Second thing that we need to provide the student is a systematic, well-organized, a, a set of instructional materials which are focused on the student needs. What that means is a division of materials that the student should be, be able to do on his own as preparation and materials that we will use to uh, allow the student to practice and to hone the skills that he's acquired on his own during the preparation. We need to um, give assistance to, assistance to students when they experience difficulties and we need to provide sufficient time for students to achieve mastery. And those through two last uh, in conditions, they really require us to provide time and space for students to actually get to, the, to get to do these things. If we are lecturing in all our contact time for the students, there will not be three and four here. We will not get that far, okay? The other interesting thing that Bloom is famous for is, is what he calls the two sigma problem, which basically talks about summative achievement, you know, outcomes basically. So if you actually look at the outcomes, which are generally speaking, they're going to be measured by, let's say, how a student performs in the final examination. Then if we, if we insist on the conventional teacher-centered lecture approach, we are going to get distributions which have a very high uh, dispersion. So that means that if we define our level of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mastery, right, then a large percentage of our students are just not going to make the grade. What we can do is we can switch. And by the way, this is for, say, a typical... A, a teacher student ratio of one to 30. For the same teacher student ratio, by switching to mastering, which means active learning, giving students time in class for them to get involved, we reduce the variance and improve the performance significantly. Now, of course, if we were to switch to tutorial uh, uh, learning, that is one to one, one teacher to one student, 
you could do a lot better. But of course, we all agree, a one to one ratio is not a very realistic thing to expect to happen at university. So this isn't achievable, but, but, but this is achievable. Okay. And actually, the difference between these two is a, a shift in the in the average by at least a significant by, by at least by standard deviation. Uh, going all the way to tutorial, we can get improvements of two standard deviations on what you would expect to get from conventional teaching. But you know, improving by one standard deviation is a really, really good result. It's the difference between 20% failure rate and 10% failure rate. Okay. Now let's talk about outcomes first, because you know the, the, the number one thing we need to do when we put a course together is define what it is we expect students to be able to do when they're done with our course. So for example, in a course in process design, right, Christina? So here, here I'd say some typical uh, process out, uh, 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 learning outcomes that one would expect from a design course. Obviously we want students to be able to perform uh, equipment costing and profitability analysis. We want them to be able to uh, synthesize sequences of separation uh, units, either zeotropic or azeotropic systems. We would like them to be able to perform maximum energy recovery heat exchange synthesis. We want them to be able to configure a control system plant wide. We want them to be able to perform has op has, and we want them to be able to work together in teams to execute a design project demonstrating both team and individual skills. So all those are typical outcomes, which we will be testing either in a project or in an exam. And these have to be presented very specifically to the students. You know, in, in my courses, every lecture has its own learning outcomes and they're all advertised. So I have course and I have week by week learning outcomes. This is really, really, really important. You make those specifications and they are like, the, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, they are cast in stone, right? And they will be tested and students know what they are. Um, let me show you how I teach. So this is now work both face to face. It's work with Zoom. The same basic idea works whether it's fully online or partially online. I'll go into more details as I'm going along. So the whole thing starts with an online lecture in which students have to prepare in advance. That means before they come to the week of activity, they have done this on their own. And basically what these uh, lectures consist of are um, a sequence of video clips between five and 15 minutes each. Um, after each clip, there is a, a, a question that they have to, a question or an exercise or some kind of activity they need to complete to make sure they understood what was in that clip. The nice thing is because everything is online, as a teacher, I get to see what all the students are doing, all the students are doing or not doing in advance. So I know how much time they spend on every video clip, how many times they repeated viewing a video clip, which video clips they repeated, how they did in the exercises, how they did it, everything. I know everything. I probably know more than I really want to know, okay? <laughs> this is like, this is really big brother, but used in a good way, okay? All right, and this is done before they see me. They, they do this on their own, right? The benefits, well, it means that they can actually get involved with the material actively, even while they're watching these videos. These uh, activities could be quizzes. They could be multiple choice or matching or numerical or other types of quizzes. They could be what I call a U-turn sandwich. That means I will, for example, demonstrate a design task with an actual example, and then, at the end of the video clip, introduce a second exercise, which I then say to the student, okay, guys, now you try and solve this on your own. In the next video clip, you'll see my solution and you can compare. This is very, very effective. Imagine trying to do this in a regular class. It's impossible. That will be the end of the class, right? But because they're doing this at home at their own pace, you can do stuff like this and it makes all the difference. The students who get involved to this point, they really, they really know the material, okay? Uh, we could be preparing for a brainstorm session in class. So I'll ask them specifically to prepare for that as part of the video and so on. The next step is a class meeting. What used to be a lecture, now it's not a lecture. The first thing we do is because I've seen how they did the tasks at home, if, there's, if there was something that was particularly difficult for the students, I can do wrap up and closure on those things in class because I already know what they did at home. But most of the time, 
I use, I use to solve open-ended problems. And the nice thing is most of the students who come to these class meetings, they're really active. Okay, and I see that happening. So what I do in class, well, again, I can use quizzes. You can see, you saw the use of uh, multimeter, for example, that works very well. Obviously, I wouldn't just be asking, you know, how you're feeling. I could ask technical questions or maybe recall questions from stuff they did at home. I could on purpose introduce uh, questions to raise their interests and have discussions. But most of the time I do open-ended problem solving. Typically what I do in class with the students is I, in the first meeting every week, every week's new material, I am solving exam level questions in class. I'm not teaching them the material, I'm applying material with their help. It makes a huge, huge difference. The last step is what we call an active tutorial. The students come to a, a class, what we do, we now do in all my courses, this is done on Zoom actually, even now, the, the, the pandemic is behind us, but I am still, I am still uh, using Zoom for this. I divide the students up into breakout rooms. They configure themselves as they wish. You can work on your own. You can work with friends. And the students working together get help from us by, by me and my staff hopping from breakout room to breakout room. So they get to practice for three hours on their own on the material. This is instead of what used to be homework. And all this means that at every phase of the week's activity, students have optimized their time investment in the course. They build basic knowledge, whereas in contact time with staff, they had to hone this knowledge on high levels of application and practice. These improvements are difficult to achieve in a regular class setting simply because there is an insufficient time to achieve it. Now, what I'm showing you here is a video clip taken 10 years ago when I started doing active tutorials this way. What we now have done is we've substituted this activity and I've actually reduced the volume of the video right down for two reasons. One, because if I put the volume up to its normal level, I wouldn't be able to hear myself talk. And two, because it's in Hebrew, notice that I've added subtitles in English. This activity is much more helpful to do in breakout rooms because every group is working on their own and nobody disturbs them. So that's the reason why I still do breakout rooms, even though, you know, in my university, we've in theory gone back to regular lecture. All right. The extra time allows for higher level work with the students. Consider the three week segment in the course covering heat exchange and synthesis in the process design course. In the first week, Students are introduced to um, uh, MER targeting and basic heat exchanger network design rules with typical exercises such as computing targets using the temperature interval method and executing simple HEN designs. That's the first week in the sequence. By the second week, they will have learned more advanced techniques, allowing them to tackle larger scale exercises in involving multiple stream splits. And by the third week of the sequence, they will have learned to apply the methodology to real problems and how to implement heat exchanger uh, network design into complete processes, as well as how to use the grand composite curve to combine multiple heat, hot and cold utilities for more profitable design. Now, all these topics in truth were taught with the same allocated time before I did flipping in my course, but students did not get as far because all the class time was used for lecturing. Imagine I've just added effectively five hours of practice time with staff in the loop. Imagine what you can do with that, okay? With, without having to teach them in theory anything. Of course, you teach them everything because to learn this material is to do it. It's not to watch your lecturer talk about it, it's to do it. So having us in the loop makes a huge difference to the performance of the students for sure. Anyone have a comment? Are you I in have order? Can I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. These lecture clips, two questions. How long are they? And the other thing is, how do you make them? I okay. Mean, it's very good that you're asking the question. It's wonderful you're asking the question. As I said before, they're typically between five and 15 minutes each. So basically, I've taken a regular lecture and broken it down. How do I do it? 
wait a second i'm going to i'm going to actually end this especially if you give me five hours <laughs> i will <laughs> i will actually show you the whole all the actual whole process okay all right and if you really want, I can actually go into a real clip and show you a real clip um, of obviously some, I, I've got all my courses in Hebrew, but I've recorded all of them in English as well. So I have everything doubled up. That means I've done everything twice, okay? Uh, in all the courses, okay? So you can wow. do it in Portuguese and in English. <laughs> I didn't get to Portuguese. Actually, I have to tell you a secret. One of the video clips in safety, I used a video produced in Portugal. I do not remember the name of the lecture, but there was a video showing the, um, the Flixborough disaster. Are any of you familiar with this video? It was produced in Portugal. So I took the video down. Yeah. So I took this video down off uh, YouTube wiped mm. out the, the soundtrack and re-recorded the soundtrack myself with all the sound effects and used this as part of my safety course. It's a beautiful piece of animation that was done in Portugal. It's totally illegal. So therefore I can only do this in my university. I cannot use, I cannot put this video back up for everyone unless I get the agreement of the, of the Portuguese gentleman who made the original one. But as a teaching aid, it's awesome. And it, by the way, it was also the first video clip i ever made it's about 10 minutes long and it took me three days to make uh, my production time has improved very very significantly since then i was actually learning how to use camtasia then anyway back to the story i have a request would you please turn the camera a little bit because we hardly see your eyes we just see your mouth and your nose. yeah the, i'll explain the problem i oh, can do sorry. this is that better no. Not really. No. Okay. Not better? Not better. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Now it's good. Yeah. Now it's okay. Better? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Great. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. I'll get rid of this now if I can. Yeah. All right. So uh, the title of my talk talked about agile teaching. What does that actually mean? Well, basically flipping freeze, cl freeze class time to incorporate the four agile uh, values into class environment. Number one, it is student-centered. And since flipping is basically student-centered, it inherently focuses on the learner rather than following traditional teacher-centered format. We use most of the class time to work problems cooperatively and also for project work. It's largely, the class time is largely reserved for collaborative work between the staff and the student. And now the lecturer isn't a transfer of information he is now a motivator and a mentor. And of course, it goes without saying that we have more time to respond to students. In fact, we have all the time in the world. We are no longer under pressure to, um, to, 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 to close all the materials that we have to teach in a certain week. That's already been done by the students at home. Now we focus on what they actually learn, how, what we actually can teach them. Richard Felder in 1995, when he talked about active learning, he said, he, he told us, he warned us that it, he, he never said it would be easy to do this. And in fact, here are some of the things that he brought up in that paper and, and uh, some of my responses. Number one, it's important to set the stage. You are gonna teach in a different way. It's likely students never were taught this way before and they will, they will be uncomfortable with the change. Uh, basically because it's quite natural for most people to want to stay passive. It's very difficult to be active and you're actually asked them to do something else. So my first meeting with students is always basically flipping 101 and not introduction to my course material. It's spending an hour talking to the students in a, in a very open way and, and actually let's have a discussion about what the objectives are going to be what the methods are going to be, what my expectations are, maybe what their expectations are, and, how, and, and what works and what doesn't. I'll be showing you some statistics about how getting involved as a student, what that means to your performance, because this is all now measurable, and they should know this, that if they don't get involved, it will affect their grades. Um, <laughs> you need to give time to coach the students on the skills you want them to develop. So actually taking time from a class to provide a mini clinic on technical issues is not a waste of time. It's actually very, very helpful. You should be open 
to your students' views and you should get feedback and response and be responsive to it. That means you listen to all the feedback from the students, even if you don't agree with everything they say. Very important, you need to keep tabs on the students, especially the ones who don't participate. And by having everything online, you know exactly who is and who isn't participating. Um, you need to be patient. This is sometimes very difficult for me. Eventually, most of the students will get it by the final exam. They really will. And you shouldn't expect to win them all. That means not every student is going to be totally infatuated with this new way of teaching. In fact, I guarantee you that at least a quarter of the class will be fighting this tooth and nail all the way to the end of the semester. Of course, if you ask most of them which way they learn most, they'll say this way, but they still don't like it. <laughs> so now this is a really tough question. So now I've given you an idea of kind of what's involved. I haven't gone into the details yet, but the question is, you know, you want to make the change. Is it, is it really worth it? Will it actually get you anything? Well, let's start with what the students think. So if you actually, I'm teaching a lot of courses. So here's data for process control from last year. It appears in one of the publications that came out in the last year. We've done a lot of publications in the last year. Um, in every course that I teach, I ask students what, how they perceive their level of confidence at every step of the way, okay? So, you know, after the online lesson, how confident are they about their understanding? So here is confidence on a range of one, absolutely no confidence at all to five, very confident. So I've got less than, less than midway, three would be an average. Uh, confidence so we're under average here after the class meeting things have improved a little bit and the biggest improvement is of course after the active tutorials you know the more they get involved the more they get active the more they feel confident in what they've learned kind of makes sense and statistically these are all significantly different distributions okay so obviously this is the most thing but this is the entire class this could be a class of like 80 students and uh, I have ways of getting responses from almost all of them so 90 percent of the class provided this data, but actually it's probably more important to try and divide them between the ones who really were active and those who weren't. And a student who wasn't active will think that active doesn't help, right? Okay. Where is the bottom line? The bottom line is outcomes, right? Final grades. So here is a typical distribution from a process, uh, con process design course before I did anything active at all. And it's exactly the distribution I started my lecture with. Okay, not great. And what I normally get, this is like a 20%, almost 20% failure rate. It can be even higher. If it's a bad class, it could be, could be worse. But this is what I typically get now. So I mean, you will all agree that there's a difference in these two distributions, right? And the failure rate, of course, has gone down. This is not surprising at all. This would be a representative case where the vast majority of the class really did get involved, okay? And that's all quantifiable, okay? But it's interesting to maybe divide um the class between those who really were active and those who weren't those who came to the exercise sessions those who didn't so for example if we take the uh, grades for the last control course this is the final grades okay so we have an average of 70 which absolutely it's it's absolutely okay it's correct from the technical point of view to have a 70 percent average but if you now divide the class into the say the 20 most active and the 20 least active the kind of things you'll see is this okay and so you see that the ones who were not active have lower grades than the ones who were. It doesn't guarantee success, but most of the students who were active did very well. And the reason that the Z value here is so high, I mean, anything above two is wonderful. So 4.51 is a huge difference. And the reason for that is that the people who weren't involved in the active tutorials that particular year, the highest grade they ever got was 80 in the whole class. Whereas all, the, all these guys, most of these guys have grades above 70, okay? So there's a huge difference between active students and, and students who aren't active. Please remember that the fact that you have presented this new way of teaching, new way of learning to the students does not guarantee that all the students will all jump on board and get involved. Some of them will even with this, all this available to them, will still crash study before the exam and not get involved during the semester. And those don't do so well in my, in my exams. Now, I was asked to describe how it's done. So here's my guide to flipping step by step. So here's my overall view. So there are seven things to worry about. You need to have a game plan. You need to prepare online lectures. 
You need to prepare effective quiz questions associated with those online lectures. You need to assemble them and test these lessons before you expose them to the students. It is very important to monitor engagement and to reach out to low engagers. This is super important. You need to plan for a useful class meeting. You've made this time, right? So think what you're going to do in class. It's going to be really value added for the students. And you need to schedule an active tutorial and make sure students work for themselves. Now let's go into those seven points one by one in detail. So having a game plan means you have to know what it is you want to achieve by doing this new way of teaching. My advice to anyone who wants to try flipping, number one, don't do this the first time you teach any course. You, you, this, is really, this, this approach is suitable if you have experience with teaching a course, you already know what students, where, where students are hurt, where they have trouble, which, which are their points of difficulty, because those are the ones you need to strengthen in, in what you prepare for their preparatory material. And in any case, if you are gonna try this, just the way I got started, start with one week. Don't do the whole course, start with one week. I think the most important thing is to convince yourself that this approach has value. So you start with one week. Which lecture do you pick? You pick the lecture that you know from your experience there was so much material this week, there's no way you can do this in a regular class, okay? So challenge this, this, new, this new approach, challenge on, on problems, on something you already have a problem with. See if it makes a difference, all right? You need to include in this lecture also what you're going to do in the class meeting and how you handle the active tutorial. It's a package deal. It's all three phases of the approach, not just the lecture. You know, flipping isn't just putting your materials online. <laughs> it's putting your materials online in a smart way so that you spend your class time doing something more useful. That's what flipping is all about. You need to be optimistic, but also be realistic. It's probably not going to work perfectly the first time, but I guarantee that if you make some time and put some effort and thought into what you're doing, you will get good results even the first time. And if you want help from me, get my email from Henrique. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not making this offer wildly. I do help. I'll tell you a story at the, at the end. It's been a beautiful story this summer, actually, in the Technion, what happened. Okay, number two, prepare online lessons. So you state learning objectives. I, I imagine that you probably do this anyway in the way you teach, but this is really, really important. You have learning objectives for the entire course. I showed you the learning objectives for my design course, but there are learning objectives associated with every single week of the course. Every week has its learning objectives. And you start the lecture, the online lecture, stating those objectives, and then you close with the objectives again, reminding how it's linked to what they've learned. You should limit lecture segments to 15 minutes at the most. It's better to even be shorter, try and make them five to 10 minutes. I have one or two segments in every course that are stretched to almost 20 minutes. And I never stop apologizing to the students that week about that. That's too much. You, we know that students um, have ability to concentrate really well for maybe 15 minutes. After that, <coughs> you're losing them. So there's no point having materials there. You need to ensure the content is complete. What does that mean? It means that unlike a regular lecture where the notes would be incomplete because you expect to have questions in class, you expect to complete um, development on, in the blackboard, you don't have this luxury at home. They're on their own. It has to be complete every step, okay? You, you're writing this material to the weakest student in your class. Think about him or her, okay? You should use a script. You probably noticed that in some key points, I was reading a script even now in front of you. Did you notice that? No. no. Oh, then I did a very good job. Okay. Well, it's a question of positioning. But when you, when you want to make sure that something is right, it's better to have it written down. And also, by the way, in the same breath, this is not, um, this is not a monumental work which will last forever. Don't make it to be bigger than it really is. And if you make a couple of mistakes and a couple of glitches, it's okay. The main thing is to keep working, okay? Uh, you should practice before recording. It's a very good idea. Th those people who've seen my online recordings, that, that was killed. I mean, I really, 
they were they were scripted and i practiced again and again and again timing is everything but i don't have time to do this for every one of the 100 clips that are typically associated with every course just imagine if i'm breaking down my lectures into five to ten or 15 minutes it's going to be something like 10 clips a week and there are 13 weeks so you figure it's order 100 clips and 100 online exercise you have to prepare for every course i have uh so far four courses in two languages so i've actually done this eight times already so i'm getting quite good at this now and that's part two uh about recording equipment well okay so i'm i'm actually using my laptop as my recording studio the camera that i'm now projecting on is the one i project to when i record my own videos it you know the video is not so important what is important is the sound you will notice i'm using one of these so I have a dynamic microphone and it's connected, ah, excuse me, it's connected to this, which is, a, which is an amplifier. It's a professional uh, musician's amplifier. My son is a musician. When I started working on these, uh, on these vi videos and I showed him my first video proudly, he said, dad, you can't work with sound like that. <laughs> so he took my hand and we went to, a, to we, we went to a shop and got this equipment. I'm very happy. So uh, I'm using Camtasia, a program called Camtasia. You can give it, a, give it a shot for a whole month for free. I'm not selling for them, but it's a fantastic product. I work only with Camtasia. It's basically I'm running PowerPoint on Camtasia. It produces videos that I can edit uh, professionally. And the sound capture device I just showed you is really, really important. Do not use the microphones on your laptop. It's, that's not very effective. And here is a picture of my recording studio. If I was to show you where I'm projecting from now, it, it looks pretty much like that. So here is, uh, you know what this is? Anyone know what this is? What is this? Microphone. It's a microphone, but what is this circle here? What is that? It's called a pop filter. When you say P, right, without that, it's like an explosion, right? So you have to protect the recording. Oh. This, this is my amplifier, right? And it's connected through, um, through the cable to my recording studio, which is my laptop on which I have Camtasia running. It is very important. Illumination is more important to camera quality. You have to make sure I have two arc lamps now pointing to me to ensure that I have enough illumination when I'm recording. That's my studio, that's it. Now, why is this better than a professional studio that I'm sure you probably have also in Lisbon? Anyone? Why is this better? I will, I will do a pantomime. <laughs> Anyone? Would you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I was why, is this, why is this studio better than a professional studio you probably have on campus? I'm sure you have a center for improving teaching and they have a video recording studio. I'm quite sure every university has, especially in, in today's uh, uh, environment. But this is better. It's portable, I can take it anywhere. It is instant and I run the show. I can produce videos from in, in one eye. If I have a question from the class, I can have a video recording, 15 minute video recording, which I've scripted, produced, recorded, edited and uploaded in one hour, okay? That kind of turnaround time is not possible because there's only one studio in your campus and other people wanna use it too. So, you know, you wanna do something like this, Oh yeah, sure, we can schedule it you one month from now. This doesn't work. So I can solve problems like this now, okay? And you know, the quality is probably not as good. So what? I'll tell you what, the quality that's really important is the technical quality of the talk, right? Now, hopefully each and every one of us, we are masters of our teaching domain. We, that part of the quality is not in question. That's what the students have come to listen to, right? So long as the sound quality is reasonable, and you get the materials clearly across, that's enough. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles that you'll be able to get from a professional recording studio. And it's going to be quick. In any case, it won't really save you very much time because the most of the work is involved here is preparing the materials for the recording, writing the script, writing the materials, writing the exercises, all those things you have to do anyway. So, you know, having a professional video studio to do the recording is not actually saving you very much time all right 
Step three, you have to have these quiz questions, right? So every video segment has to have a question there to test where the student has comprehended what he's just listened to. It is important to write explanations for all the answers. Typically, it's going to be multiple choice. Let's say there are four alternative answers, one correct answer, three incorrect answers. Every one of those answers has to have an explanation. If it's right, why it's right. If it's wrong, not necessarily give everything away, but give a hint about what the student should do instead. And as far as I'm concerned, let the students answer as many times as they like. By elimination, they'll eventually get to the right answer. And if they take the time to read all the explanations, they will learn an awful lot from this experience. That's what this is about. This is not a test. This is learning. This is them learning. Okay. That's why we're doing this. Okay. So I want students to get 100 out of 100 in their quizzes. And they'll get 100 out of 100, no problem, because eventually they'll get them right. So long as what happens, anyone? So long as and didn't hear, speak up. So long as what? Conditional on what? They try. They have to try. They have learned. Then, well, no. They, the thing is, they'll get the right answer in the end. But basically, I'm expecting to actually have listened to the recordings, right? And mm -hmm. remember, I said up front, Big Brother. I know how much time they're spending on the recording, so I know whether they've really listened to it or not. By the way, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. And there's a question here. How, how do you know? How do you know uh, the time that they use for reading the video? for listening to the video? I'll get to I'll get to it in point five. One one second. Right, okay. Right. I'll, I'll right. be there in a second. I'll be there in a second. So now I have the videos and I have the questions. I have to put everything together. I use Moodle lessons. Do you guys use Moodle? No. No. What do you have? Canvas? What do you have? We have our own system that we call Phoenix. And uh, does it allow you to put together online lessons of the nature that I'm describing here? Yeah, we put the material there, but uh, we just put the material there, uh, yeah. like a PDF. Yes. Uh, Can you so see? do you have a way of assessing what, what the students have done with this material? Uh, no. 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 So yeah. I would recommend that you think about changing the system. Yeah. Google yeah. Google Google. Uh, by the way, know no, 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 that Moodle is totally open source and it's free. So it's not like it's going to cost you. And what will cost you is the effort of getting it absorbed into your system. But trust me, this is really worthwhile. You get a lot back from doing this. All right. So you test the flow and response to your system, but it's really important to have an assistant check. If the system wasn't involved in preparing this material and he'll find mistakes you cannot find, right? You never, you're never able to find your own mistakes. So now you are asked about how do I know what they do? So you need to monitor student engagement. Now, because everything is online, uh, for example, I can, I have a count who turned up to the active tutorials because it's on Zoom. Uh, Moodle tells me about lesson engagement and video engagement I get from Panopto. It's a video service. So I know for every student how much time the videos were open on their computer and they were running. Not only that, because each lesson is made up of video segments, I also know how many times each of the video segments was viewed by every student. So I'm saying, you could say, and I'd be, I'd be prepared to accept the fact, the fact that a student runs a video on his computer doesn't necessarily mean that he's listening to the video, right? He could have the video running, he could be going having a cup of coffee or speaking to his friends at the same time. However, because each lesson is something like order 10 video clips, the person would have to turn on 10 video clips, each of five minutes long, and go and do something else and come back just to you know, make me happy. It doesn't, it's not likely. Furthermore, why would he do this more than once for every video if he just wants to play, play with me, right? So let me show you something. There are a couple of measures that I'm, I'm listening, I'm looking at. Lesson engagement is the... Um, the student's viewing time for a lesson, adding up all the times that he spent on all the videos in the lesson, divided by the actual video running time. So obviously, LE greater than one means that either he's watched the video more than once at higher, at more than one time speed, or he's seen all the videos at least a one time through. So for example, lesson engagement of like two would mean he's seen everything twice. Video engagement, VE, 
is the number of times students access the video clips in that lesson divided by the number of video clips there are. So again, VE more than one would mean they've watched the videos more than once, right? So look, this is a distribution for the first six weeks of a course I just finished teaching this semester. Numerical methods course to 117 students, which was taught using this method. So what you're seeing here on the x-axis is a VE. So you're seeing, obviously, there's a cluster beginning at one, right? And if you go into the depth, that's uh, the first, each line is a week. So you can see the six weeks lined up one behind the other. And this whole area here, this is VE greater than one, okay? So more than half the class are watching the videos more than once. So these guys, they are all learning for sure, right? Why would, you, why, would you, why would you want to watch a video again? You missed something, you didn't understand, you want to learn. So this is, this is actually happening, okay? That's a fact. Does that answer your question about how do I know? Yes. <laughs> All right. How is it in doing it? <laughs> Say again? No, I don't know how we can do it because for the lesson engagement, I think we are not able to put Moodle if you've done your recording, your recording isn't on Moodle, your recording is on a video server. For example, you have a video server called Panopto, and there's something called Panopto Analytics, which at a click of a finger, you get an Excel telling you how much time they spent on every video clip or on the entire lesson, however you want to organize this. It's very, very easy to access this information. For every course, I spend five minutes a week just, just sorting out the data. And, a, and I can generate this stuff very, very quickly. And actually, I'm not all that worried about most of the students. What concerns me most are the students who are not doing the work. And those are the ones I need to chase up. Now, once I know who the students are who are not actually doing the work, I send them emails, not each individually, but I'll be sent package to, by group. And they'll get every week, they'll get, they'll get Danny saying, look, I really care about the fact you're not studying, but you're not studying. This is, not going to, this is not the way you're going to pass the course. I'll do this for the first half of the semester. If it hasn't had any effect after that, I stop bugging the person because he's obviously not interested. But a lot of the students will respond very favorably to this. It's not, you're not, you're not in, 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 um, imposing on their privacy. You care about them. You want them to succeed in your course. That's the way you have to address them. It's not, you've been a bad person. You didn't do this. No, I'm concerned that you're not learning. Let me help you, right? That's the tone. And this can be very, very effective. You turn people around like this. This is really important. And those are the ones, by the way, those are the students that you make a difference to. You know, everyone obviously wants to focus on their very best students, right? Oh, I've got these really excellent students. The very, very excellent students in your class, regrettably or not, were excellent before you touched them. <laughs> you know, maybe if you do, if you if you do your job badly enough, you may make them bad students. But very, <laughs> yeah, the excellent students, they were independently excellent of you. But the mediocre students, the ones who weren't achieving what they could achieve, you can turn those guys around. Okay, by the way you by the way you you perform. So th those are the ones you're trying to. That, and that's how you get an improvement in the, in the statistics in your course, by taking the very poor students and making them good students. That is how you make a difference, okay? And you know some of those students end up being graduate students too. So you really make a big difference to them and to basically the final result. And that's your job, right, as a teacher. It's not to make excellent students. <laughs> They're the ones who are excellent anyway, just try not to ruin them, okay? <laughs> But the ones who are mediocre, they're the ones you can improve. Now, you, all this, you did all this preparation to use the class usefully. So now you have all this time in your class, get problem-solving activities with the student participation. That should be the focus of what you do in class. Use polls and quizzes to keep them in the loop. And this is the most difficult thing for me. You try very hard to be less critical, more positive, and especially more patient with students. Sometimes this involves biting your tongue <laughs> last time and not respond when some really, really silly remarks get made. You have to really, really control yourself. Sometimes that is very, very difficult. I'm getting better at this as I get older, okay? You, usually it doesn't work that way. 
Now, the whole point is that you're, you're using your time with the students to show how everything comes together, stuff that's really very difficult to do in a regular class. But if students come prepared, you really do serve as an integrator for them and with them. This can really work. And of course, active tutorials, right? You've got to schedule time for it. This is students sitting quietly working for themselves. Our best results are with Zoom break breakout rooms or explain why already. And now what you need to do is you need to make sure that you touch the learning objectives that you've advertised for that week with the exercises that you, you set for that week. So there's a combination of various levels of exercises, but also make sure you touch the, the, the important learning objectives for the week. You need to have time for them to discuss what they're doing. It's not just number crunching. They have to understand the meaning of what they're doing. For this, you need time. Okay. And also, we don't grade their hope. This exercise is not graded. The, the, the solutions are already available online. They want to check that their results are correct. Check it with the solution. Not solving it yourself means you didn't get anything out of it. Just looking at the solution is not helpful. You need to actually break your teeth on the solutions yourself to learn. That's really important. I want to just advertise something really cool that happened this month. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the Kate Forum that took place in Twente about two weeks ago, uh, 14th to the 16th, not even two weeks ago, 14th to the 16th of um, September, where there was a Kate Forum held at Twente. And they asked me to uh, run a course development workshop, which I did. By the way, it's the first time I ever did this. And the results were absolutely awesome. What we did, we, uh, we had four keynotes uh, we, who talked at the beginning of the meeting. Once they finished talking, we started working. We divided all the participants into four groups. Each group took on <clears throat> uh, the, ta the task of developing uh, an entire course on the subject of the keynote. So there was one course on carbon neutral PSC. Actually, there's a guy in the audience. Tony, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so Tony, I invited Tony to listen in. Hi. I also copied my link to the Cape Forum. <laughs> yeah, so Tony was on the carbon yes. neutral team. Uh, there was also... <laughs> my office is falling apart. Never mind. Topic two was sustainable bio-based PSC. Energy-based PSC was topic three. AI for PSC. So hot topics in PSC. And in three hours... Uh, these teams actually put together the, the framework for these new courses. Obviously, it's not a complete course, but they touched learning outcomes, they touched kind of exercises they would have for a typical week of, of, the, of the course. It was really a neat, a neat thing. We're going to be running uh, the same kind of workshop also in Escape 33. I started to talk to uh, Antonis about this. So we'll run another one like this. Again, using the idea is basically to use keynotes or plenaries from the conference as nuclei for new courses and just have people experience within two or three hours experience what's involved in putting together a course like this okay so and of course we could probably do something like this in a university setting subtle hint and it can probably also be done online by the way i'm quite sure that i mean you notice how much interaction there was today in principle it could be online of course the downside is I don't get to eat pastel de nata from here. <laughs> I mean, that would be a big bummer from my point of view. But from the point of view of the potential success of a workshop, it doesn't have to be this. All right. So now the bottom line is in class. I've been looking for you for eight months. Whenever I should have had a gun in my right hand, I thought of you. Now I find you in exactly the position that suits me. I had lots of time to learn how to shoot with. My left. <laughs> When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. 
<laughs> oh, in class, when you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk, or in other words, keep your students active. Don't talk to them. Don't lecture to them. Get them working. That's the point. So that is the main, the main idea of what I've been saying today. You need to give time in your teaching for students to get active. Now, flipping works for me because it frees my class time for that. You need to find something that works for you. And you need to do this, not just a one-time thing, the whole semester. Now, I have another, another question for you. Uh, mm, I will put another question up, just a second, a bit of patience. Yep. Uh, I will wait about one more minute for this. Oh, there we go. All right. Now, let's see. Can you see the new question now? Same link as before, same number as before. Can you guys see the new question? Again, it's uh, www.menti.com. The code is 83875757. Write down one new thing that you've learned today. You can add more than one thing. It can be in Portuguese too. <laughs> Let's see if anyone, can you see the new question guys? Yes. Good. So let's see what you have to say. Just one word. Well, one um, word, a sentence, whatever. Okay. Anything, totally free format. And there are at least 15 of you, so I'll wait for 15. You yeah, know, one. Whoa. Yes. Now, what's nice about the word cloud option is the more people who write the same thing, the bigger it becomes. So right now, uh, these three have all been entered separately by people. But as soon as anybody enters the same thing again, then that, that remark becomes bigger. Now, this is really, really helpful, really, really helpful to do this in class. You can get a lot out of a class by using this. And totally free format. You can almost do this on the fly in a class. And it gives the impression the student that you care about what they're thinking. And, and of course, the anonymity of it is so wonderful. They don't have to say anything. They just type. Yeah, cool. So, so I've had four comments so far. Yeah. 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 Oh, wonderful. Wow. Yes. <laughs> just shoot, don't talk. Yes. Just shoot, don't think. <laughs> <laughs> great yeah yeah cool okay i think that we've understood basically that's lovely so active learning is the winner which i guess you guys got the point there's a lot of active in there. active students keep the students active active is yeah so that's the point right that's why we're doing this I'm not so, it's not like I'm selling this flipping thing. It was just a very convenient way of clearing time to give students time. Basically, you know what? We're giving the students time to get things wrong, right? They need to experiment, get things wrong, understand why it's wrong, and then get it right. And this may take more than one iteration. You need to have time for this. And if you're lecturing, if that's all you're doing in your contact time, that's gone. They're doing all this experimentation on their own at home, maybe, right? Maybe, but with no control and no help. All right, so to summarize, I told you before about Richard Felder's comment. He said, we never said it would be easy, right? That was from his 1995 paper. So here's another comment from my West. Said, I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. Now, I'm, I hope that I've shown you in my talk that it is worth it to try this because you can get really, really good results. And I hope that this has been helpful to you. And if there are any more questions or comments, this will be the time to hit me with them. So off you go, guys. Thank you very much. I think that you must come. Yeah, invite me. And stay for one week teaching us and experimenting with us. Active. 
Active learning. Yeah. You're great. It can it can't be any worse than this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but nice. But you notice how effective it can be. I don't have to be there. Obviously, as I said, there are a lot of advantages of being in Lisbon that I cannot enjoy from here. But making a point, getting a point across, I've had a lot of experience teaching like this, and it can be really, really effective. I, had, I was teaching plant design the last time I taught it to a mixed class of Chinese and Israeli students working in mixed teams, and everybody was working at home. And it was awesome what you can do. It's really, really amazing. And, you know, overcoming language barriers, overcoming cultural barriers, and it can all be done online. So obviously, you know, face to face, it can only be better, right? But it's, you know, the, the, it can be done distance. It's not, you're not, you're not constrained by the fact that it, you, you know, talking to somebody over Zoom. We are, I think we had a very intimate meeting now, even though we're 2000 miles apart. So what? <laughs> yes, yes, I think. Uh, but, invi but invite me, and I will be very happy to come. Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> I think the most important thing is that you mentioned that you need. We need to convince ourselves to. Yes, move, yes, yes. Move. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep, yep. So start uh, small. My colleague, my colleague uh, Alda. I, I have uh, one question, one or two. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Uh, I think we all loved it. Uh, now, practical things. Now, where do you publish your videos? Where do I publish mine? The video, the video, the clips. Um, the videos are only on the inside internal um, internal computer internal system in the Technion. I'm I freely steal from everyone. I describe this wonderful video that was written in Portuguese. That was the first one I stole. But I have Beatles, I have Monty Python, I have all kinds of things in my lessons that there's no way I could possibly put this up on YouTube. That's in the Hebrew version. In the English versions, I've been very careful to try and avoid this kind of behavior. Um, you mentioned before, as part of the textbook, our textbook, the fourth edition, there's an ebook. You, you, you mentioned the 90 videos, those are all taken from my online lessons. So they are all available through the book. I, I plan to put all the English videos on some kind of server that are freely achieved, um, you know. I, I'm sorry, that's not really the question. The question is, where do your students go to oh, the clips? Yeah. Now, Moodle, uh, you, you guys want me to give a quick demo? I can actually show you this. I've got, I've got sites, hang on a sec. Uh, 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 can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm now, I'm now going on. I'm now going online to the Moodle system. It, they're going. They made all kinds of changes to make it more difficult to get in, but I will eventually get in. Yeah. So what you see here is a complete list of all the courses that I teach. There's quite a long list. Okay. All right. Some of them are in English and some of them are in Hebrew. But you see, these are the English versions. So, for example, let's go to plant design. I need to also be logged into Panopto. One second. Okay. Okay. So, here are my online lessons, for example. Let's say I'm going to, I take the students to, a, to a, let's say, to, a design of reboiler circuits, just uh, okay. So, for example, this is a Moodle lesson. This is a you see now, every, the lessons have a, an introduction, and every uh, video clip, every video clip has associated with it a question. So, you watch the video clip, right? For example, I could open the video clip, okay, and I will do what this most hi there, and welcome to lesson four of the course. Plant design. Double in this lesson, we shall learn about the mechanical design of reboiler circuits. A reboiler circuit is a term used to describe the circulation of liquid from the bottom of a distillation column to the reboiler, where it is partially or fully vaporized to return to the column. 
Ideally, we will try to accomplish this by setting up a circuit driven by natural convection, referred to as a thermosiphon, in which case we can do without this circulating pump. Before we start, let us review the learning objectives for this lecture. After this lecture, you should be able to explain the physics behind a thermosiphon to a layman. You should be able to differentiate between the main types of reboiler arrangements in use and explain their advantages and disadvantages. You should be able to perform sizing calculations for a thermosiphon in any configuration, and you should be able to select and design the appropriate reboiler circuit for a given application. This lecture... Enough? More? Anyone want to see something else? I have a course on control. I have a design course. I have a plant design It's based on course. one very short paper Whoops. written by uh, Kern, thermosiphon... Okay. So basically, that's the begin this is the beginning of a lesson on on, uh, on uh, reboiler design. It has what? How many? Let me see. Uh, and the and the questions and the answers. Yeah, yeah. For example, here, what can you? you know, yeah, you. How can you? How do you receive the, the answers? It's so now, you, so for example, it says here, what condition has to be set to enable thermostat and reboiler circuit to operate correctly? That's if they were listening to the previous video. So the friction loss of the entire world has to be lower than the difference between the static head. So I could, uh, the friction loss of the entire world has to be greater than blah, 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 blah. the entire world has to be higher, have to be friction loss have to be lower. The density of the fluid of the riser has to be greater than yeah. so the correct answer is this one, right? Correct? The correct answer is the first one, suppose I actually answered the wrong one. Okay. So I get as a response Wrong answer. On purpose, I didn't give any other information other than the wrong answer. So I'd like to try again. I'm giving the student option to try again. So he tries again. And let's say now he gets it correct. And if he answers correctly, he gets correct answer. Okay. And I can go on to the next part. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm totaling up his responses i can see his responses that's how I, but but at the same time i'm also i'm also the panopto is keeping tabs on how long he spent on the video if he doesn't watch the video he won't get any credit at all yeah everything is recorded on, on moodle you, you have the statistics from moodle yeah yeah the, the moodle moodle give me statistics of his quiz but for the video stuff i have to get the the log from um from uh, panopto. and actually that's that's actually the most important thing because the, the grades, everyone will get 100, even somebody who didn't watch the video. He'll have, <laughs> he'll have got the answers from his friends and just typed in the answer and get zero credit. And he'll, and he'll complain and I will send him a video log from Panopto to explain why he got zero. And that's the last time he does that. From now on, he'll watch the videos. Oh, I have another question, if you don't mind. Yeah. I didn't quite understand this Camtasia. What kind of thing is this? I went to look on to look up on the internet, and it says that it is a software. Yep. <coughs> uh, where is it? Oh, it's probably over but, here. but you've shown, but you've shown the, the microphone plus that small box. So yeah, no, 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 no. The Camtasia, Camtasia is a piece of software. Hang on a sec. Um, it'll it'll pop up eventually. It's quite a heavy program. They keep telling us about the, okay, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, I will now open a project that has nothing, nothing at all to do with my teaching, okay? So it's just to, to create the video, the video clip. Yeah. But basically, I, what I do is when I run PowerPoint, uh, I can be recording the PowerPoint presentation as I give it on Camtasia. So it produces a video of my projection of the PowerPoint onto which I can edit. I can add other effects. I can add other videos and so on and so on. This is taking forever to go up. Amazing. It's a tiny little video. But you can do it on, on PowerPoint. PowerPoint can, can record it. Yeah, but yeah, but the trouble with the recording on the PowerPoint is you can't really edit it very well. You definitely can't add other media. Do you notice that what I just showed you now was actually you could see was PowerPoint, but later on there'll be videos of all kinds of things coming in. I can demonstrate a real reboiler circuit as part of my presentation. Okay. And, and I mean, you it in the, in the Zoom, using Zoom model. I'm sorry. No, it's Zoom is a, Zoom is a terrible way of recording in because the the, the 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 quality is really bad. 
and it's not really editable properly. The advantage of Camtasia is basically is that what you get is you get a you get a video editor. So let me show you, not a technical thing, but you can you guys see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Can you hear the music? Yeah. yeah. Deep massage. So there's voice over. There's a, there's a music. You see the, the music track? Can I buy some massage? You noticed there was a there was a little. I flashed up a um a little sign at the beginning, right? If you have a little bit of a little bit of patience, I will actually look for that first video I ever made, right? And you'll see how you'll see why it took me three days to do it, because it has 20 tracks. It has 20 tracks, it has video tracks, it has a number of soundtracks layered on top of each other. I mean, I read basically I used that first video I ever made as a way of learning everything that I would ever want to or need to know about Camtasia in the first video. Yeah, it's a video with Victor. So basically I used that I used that experience to learn to use the tool. And since then I haven't learned I haven't learned anything basically much new, a few tricks here and there. But basically I learned the trade in those three days. So oh, okay, it took me three days to make the video, but basically that was my course of Camtasia. And by the way, they have tremendous online videos on youtube freely available so you i mean i learned by watching their videos and actually mostly by making my own video and by the way that's exactly a mirror of what i'm expecting from my students right how will they learn what i'm teaching them by actually applying it for themselves right so i learned camtasia by applying camtasia for myself producing a piece of video that I actually needed for my course. I mean, there was a need for it, but basically I went overboard. I probably did much more in this video than I really needed to do because I wanted to learn. Daniel, uh, right. sorry, just one question. I, I saw it also, and I saw that it, it has a price. Do we have uh, to buy it for oneself? You will or? not, you will not to, but the price is, I think it, it's something like a hundred dollars per copy. It's not money. Okay. Yeah, three hundred. What I saw. Euros. Euros. Oh, okay. Uh, it's the same for it's the same for education. Uh, they probably would give a discount if you're going to buy a whole bunch of them, and yeah, you'll, need, right. you'll need you'll need to have you'll need to have a copy of this on your on each of your laptops. You can't uh -huh. spawn it. But I'll tell you something, guys. I recommend that before you run off to buy, yeah. download it for free and use it for a month for free. Yeah, yeah. Make sure that you're comfortable with the code before you rush out and buying it. Okay. Yeah, I actually, yeah. I actually, I actually heard about it and just went ahead and bought it. But it doesn't have to be this way. They'll let you use it for a month for free. Yes. Okay. Any See? other question? Uh, and from the and if you have any, and if you have any technical questions, I have an email. I answer my email. <laughs> yes. So I, we will be yes. asked. Asking, we will be asking you. I am expecting you to ask. If I don't get any comments at all from Lisbon, I failed today. <laughs> you will, you will. I yeah. think the, the the highest challenge now is to find some colleagues that are convinced to, to change to make something flip. And uh, after, if you have two or three, two or three, uh, maybe we can make a, a joint meeting with you. Uh, by yeah. Zoom or something, and then yeah. we can uh, clarify some points that they, they want to. Mm -hmm. So, if there is no questions from the people that is in virtual, uh, hi, hello. Can I can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Jose. Yeah. So, I'm convinced for courses at the master level. Okay. Ah, okay. So, my question is: Has you do you have any experience from your colleagues or something on application of these? to more fundamental courses like first, second year, for example. Oh, yes, I was gonna tell you about my little experience this summer. I was excited about something that happened this summer. We, we have a course um, on mechanics in the physics department, which is taught to like even, I mean, basic, basic course in mechanics, Newton's laws. 
taught to uh, students right at the beginning of their of their of their of their, of their uh, studies at the Technion. Now, many students uh, do not study physics in high school in Israel, and yet they are accepted to the Technion. But they need to take they need to get their physics up to the level of mechanics. This first course generally used to be taught by those, those people who come without any physics, they would have to do a prep course before they come to the first mechanics course. For the last 10 years, the Tekken has been running a special course that takes people with no knowledge at all and brings them to the same level of the first mechanics course that a student with physics knowledge would get to as well. And it's taught right at the very beginning. This summer, there were two courses, one taught to experienced people who came with high school experience and those who came with none at all, all right? The course that was taught by students who didn't come with any physics knowledge was taught by the Dean of the Physics Department. And he was so excited about what I'm suggesting in flipping, he decided he would flip the course. This is the first time he's ever had this experience, okay? All right, so that's the background. So he had 25 students in his class and they just finished their exam. They take the same exam that the students who come with experience take, right? So they both, I have two groups of students, one who were taught regularly, not flipped, and who came with physics background, right? And the ones who came empty, right? And they both ended up at the same exam. The average grade for our students with no background was 80. And the average grade for the students who came with physics background was 66. Now, wait, 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 wait. Now that sounds very impressive. This has been taught for 10 years. We have 10 years of data for these two groups. And generally speaking, the students who come with no background at all get 10% lower grades than the ones who come. Right? So we've taken this situation, right? The weak students, the, high, the strong students, and we did this in one semester. So that's what I have to say about a base. I mean, you, I don't think you can get any more basic than uh, a course in mechanics, right? A basic course in mechanics. What did they do for flipping? They took pre-recorded video clips, right? They cut them down, the little portions, and added questions after each one, and they brought students to class only to work problems. They were not lectured in class at all, right? And that's the result. So I'm very excited about this. this is really an awesome result. And you know, I thought I said to them, if we get the same result, if we can get them to have the same average grade, that will be a great, a great achievement. They didn't get the same grade, they got 10% higher grades, even more than 10% higher. It's a standard deviation higher. And these guys came with no physics background at all. They were totally empty. So, so that, there's my there's my answer to Jose. All right, I don't okay, think that I think this technique can be used in any course. It is basically limited by the excitement and the and the commitment of the teacher. That's the limit. 